Hey, Mariam. Thank you so Hi. much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on these uh, 10 webinar sessions with us at the 9 to 1 Heritage Talks. I'm going to give a quick introduction to what this program is about. And then um, just to keep the content in league, um, then I will introduce you, the abstract, and then we will begin with you. We'll have 20 minutes or 30 minutes with you in uh, while you were presenting, and then we will ask a few questions and then we will open to the public. So uh, as we know, PCC has been established for the people to engage with arts and culture in the built environment. And the politics of it is uh, thinking about in alliance, um, keeping in mind that how cities are expanding and how historic quarters or sections need to be looked into from a live-in perspective rather than romanticizing a nostalgic uh, lens. So in the last uh, few, I mean, this has been like a dream where I had been thinking about that how one can bring um, a conversation in South Asian perspective. Instagram, Instagram gave us that um, liberty to bring people together and uh, running Heritage Walk Karachi as a project made us think about looking at other projects like Art Deco Mumbai, Calcutta Houses, Heritage Walk in Pindi, how they were radically thinking about what walking and activism means in the built environment. So 921 Heritage Talks is a project of Pakistan Chalk Community Center where we are going to host webinars for three days, for 10 days, uh, for almost um, every six months dedicated to discussing the politics of heritage and preservation in Pakistan and in South Asia. The dialogue on heritage is a global conversation which must take into account the local context in a rapidly changing world. The dialogue around heritage preservation is shaped by many and relatively new factors. The parameters of what constitutes heritage are expanding and take into account not just the past and the tangible heritage sites, but our present and as well as our current relationships with the spaces we inhabit as communities. <clears throat> I welcome Mariam Nizam to be part of this, our second session, um, where Mariam Nizam is a senior heritage assessment officer at Heritage NSW in the Department of Planning and Environment in Parramatta. She has worked as heritage consultant in the private sector, as well as an undergraduate thesis advisor at Premier Art and Architecture Schools. Ms. Nizam is most prominently known for her work in, in building conservation sciences, historic assets, assessments, conservation management of world heritage sites and policy and implementation. She completed her uh, bachelor's in architecture from NCA, which is North National College of Arts in Lahore, and worked um, at Heritage Foundation for some time, I, as you know, we were colleagues as well. And just to um, put the perspective on what we are going to talk about today uh, is something very, very close to our hearts. And uh, especially with the practitioners who are in the midst of this built environment and constantly thinking about how to preserve and conserve such uh, uh, ruptured zones, which are commercialized as well as residential and mixed use. So the topic of today is uh, policies and bylaws, gaps in heritage management and preservation. Uh, our abstract says that who plays the key role in preservation, protection, and restoration of heritage sites and antiquities? Is the government responsible for these tasks? The current policies and procedures of conserving heritage in Pakistan are largely a continuation of the British Raj, mostly built upon the guidelines of the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act of 1904. Since independence in 1947, these legislations have been altered from time to time with a major de development in 2011, with the passing of the 18th Amendment that transferred power from the national to provincial level. The issues and the gaps in the current legislation have played our history under threat. As current challenges unfold, we need to have active and engaged governance of our cities, which accounts for present day urban challenges and urgent need to protect our shared heritage. As the country continues to expand in multiple directions, combined with a steady increase in population, the urban space becomes contested. Under these circumstances, how is the state's relationship with citizenry redefined and times of change, what is the role of heritage preservation? Who should step up to shoulder the responsibility? These are some really, really important queries. And we would like now to Mariam share her experience and her thesis, what she thinks with her past experience. I welcome you now. Thanks, Marvi. Thanks so much. I'm just going to quickly go into the presentation. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Um, Super. So. 
All right. So first of all, I would like to pay my respects and acknowledge the Daruk people who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I join you today and to elders past and present. Um, the views expressed in this presentation are solely those of the author and do not respect, uh, reflect the views of, the Her of Heritage New South Wales, the Department of Planning and Environment or the Heritage Council of New South Wales. Um, so I'm just gonna start off right off the bat with um, the heritage legislation in what is now considered the land of uh, land that contains Pakistan. So obviously the British did have uh, some uh, acts, uh, um, legislation that was passed that would pertain to Madras and Bengal and Bihar and Orissa, which predate uh, 1878. But um, the ones that pertain to Pakistan first start from the Treasure Trove Act. Uh, interestingly, um, what's important to note is that you know one of the first words from the from in hindi or sanskrit or urdu that merged into the british language was loot and as you and you can see the treasure trove act was one of the first ones that related to you know the regulation of um antiquity movement of antiquity from india to other parts of the world. Um, and then in 1904, you have the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act. Um, and then you have some amendments to that act. And then in 1969, you have the Customs Act. Um, and of course, what's important to note is that, you know, the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act was in effect till um, partition, till when the British were in power. Um, and then the first one that the, so uh, the ones that I'm going to be talking about are the ones that are highlighted. So I'm, then I'm going to be talking about 1975 Antiquities Act and as amended in 1992, I'm going to be talking about um, the Karachi building town planning regulation and preservation of structure of special architectural or historic interest. Um, but I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm going to be referencing the one that was amended in 2002. Um, I will then also be talking about the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act. There's a whole bunch of other legislation as well, as you can see. So it's not that we have a shortage or a lack of regulatory function within the government. It's, it's just how is it implemented and what is the context, content of that legislation. Um, so I'm just, this is one of um, a, a, a quote that I really love by K. Ting, Kenny Ting, um, he's uh, put it in his paper in 2015, which is what we decide to do with our heritage defines the kind of civilization or nation or community or family or person we are, who we are. So really it's not just heritage isn't just, you know, a nation or a community, it, it drops down right to who you are as a person. Um, so one of the first things that Interestingly, that you know, you talk about the British Raj is that there there are four stages of monumentalization of heritage in the subcontinent. So the first one is the interaction stage, where European travelers discover Indian architecture and they interpret it uh, that interpret their categories based on what they understand as with Western antiquity. So what they understand of Greek or Roman architecture is what is how architecture in India is um, categorized. So that's, this is the 15th and 16th century. Um, and then in 1784, you have um, the Asiatic society that's uh, established and it's doing a lot of research in linguistics and philology and it's collecting antiquity and it's studying it. But what we see really in, in that later part of the, the 18th century is that the focus then shifts from the text to actual material artifact and ruins because they find that script or text that they find in India is kind of, you know, has a blurred boundary between fiction and, um, uh, you know, fiction and, and, and fact. So for them, they're looking for authenticity and verification, which, you know, the scientific or Western ideals of how history should be written. Um, and then you have the categorization stage, which is from about when the archaeological survey of India is set up. Um, and it's and, and at that time, it's it's basically communal periodization of history. So Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, it's basically the history of India is projected as as 
based on a religious segregation um, and it excludes regional styles or eras or you know so it's just basically you know these are the hindu uh, 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 monuments these are the buddhist ones and these are the muslim ones um, and then really in the fourth stage which really cements that uh, monumentalization is the is the conservation policy the ancient monuments preservation act and and it gives the secular colonial state the authority to interfere in religious affairs under the pretext of con conservation and how does it do that um, so the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act in 1904, the colonial state could acquire non-functional monuments without an owner. So anything that was in ruined state, um, except a gift or bequest of any protected monument, and it could enter into an agreement with an owner and therefore restrict their right to destroy, remove, alter, deface the monument or build on or near the site of the monument. And while that happened, they also had to give, have an obligation to allow access to the public. And then the fourth one is that, very interestingly, it allowed the compulsory pur purchase for public consumption of monuments in danger of being destroyed or injured and allowed to fall into, fall into decay. So, so really, it gives the secular colonial state a lot of um, you know, power um, to, to own a lot of. So what it's really doing is that the central government, which was the colonial state, it had it gave it three basic arms. So it it gave it the ability to declare to declare a monument. So it, they had the ability to disseminate their own institutionalized narrative of Indian history. So what was important, what wasn't important, what belonged to whom. Um, and then automatically they also were able to, because they were able to own and control, they were dispossessing local communities and ritual and communal sharing. So, cause you have a lot of heritage that is shared in, in the subcontinent, you know, shrines are visited by Hindus and Muslims, but you know, that kind of declaration kind of divided or, you know, segregated communal sharing of, of monuments. And then the first one, the last one is, is conservation. So it, it allowed them to conserve the, the monuments, but in their own ideals. So, you know, the earliest um, images of Britain, uh, of India in Britain that was disseminated are like these beautiful ruins set in like this backdrop of a garden. And so, and, and you know, with, and even now you have that kind of uh, view that a monument should sit within pristine and opulent gardens and panoramic landscapes, but it also dispossesses context and community use. Um, so, and then obviously you have the ma manual from John John Marshall that really cements that conservation policy, um, and you know he had, he had four objectives: hypothetical restorations were not required unless they were essential to the stability of the building. Every original men, me, member of the building was to be preserved. Um, de demolition and reconstruction should only be undertaken if the structure could not be um, uh, otherwise maintained. Restoration of carved stones could only be done if you could attain that ex excellence. Um, and then, you know, no case that mythological or other scenes to be recarved. Of course, John Marshall's um, conservation manual went on to kind of form you know, a lot of it went on to inform a lot of the earlier um, international Athens and Venus charters. But obviously, since then, there has been a lot of, um, you know, other international charters that look beyond the material, um, you know, like, say, for example, the Appleton Charter or the Iname Charter or the NARA document on authenticity or, um, you know, even the Barra Charter, it, it talks about more values based um, uh, uh, conservation and it talks about the intangible aspects they talk about you know how the the city or the 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 context around the monument has a has a part to play um so uh so so then it's basically what we're really talking about is what is what is a monument versus living heritage. So uh, I'm I'm going to now talk about some of the acts that that have were co had come into effect after the independence of Pakistan. So the first one, obviously, is the Antiquities Act, and um, obviously we know that this was 
devolved um, and repealed. So, but we're still going to, because it forms the basis of a lot of um, the legislation uh, that ha that exists. So, so what the Antiquities Act does is, unlike the ancient Monuments Preservation Act, um, this one puts a date. So it puts an age value at the start. It says ancient means belonging to or relating to any period prior to May 1875. Um, it also has, as you can see, a definition for what antiquity is. I'm not going to read it, um, but you, you guys can can have a have a quick read. Um, uh, so what, what it does is that it really, as you can see, it has a really broad um, definition of what antiquity it is. It could be any, any ancient product of human activity. It could be, you know, of historical or ethnographic uh, or scientific or military or anthropological interest. It could be a national monument or any other object as well. Um, and then it also defines immovable antiquity. And, and interestingly, part three is a bit confusing for me because it talks about any rock cave or other natural object of historical, but then it also includes an urban site, street group of buildings or public square of special value, which the federal government being of the opinion that it, that it should be preserved. So, um, you know, so, so it's, it's really broad, but also very descriptive. Um, and uh, we'll we'll come back to that later in the in the the definitions later in the in the presentation. But but just have a have a quick read of of what the definitions of immovable and antiquity are. They're 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 really broad in in their in their encompassing encompassment. Um, and then you've got a definition for national monument as well. So again more definitions of, so there's, as you can see, there's multiple definitions of what an antiquity or an built or um, a monument or uh, an ancient item could be. So there's also that there's multiple words being used for, for heritage um, items. So then the Anti Antiquities Act also, so as in the, uh, the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act, um, the, the, the role, the central role was played by the secular government, but the Antiquities Act is the first time where you put an advisory committee in. Um, and then the advisory, so the Antiquities Act says that, you know, there will be a director, then two representatives, one each from the education and division tourism, and then three other people. So there's a six member um, party uh, advisory committee. Um, and then it also puts a restriction on repairs and renovations uh, unless it is approved by the director. Um, you know, uh, they could be minor adjustments necessary for day-to-day -day use, or it could be provide. It could be anything else as well. Um, it also sets a pen penalty, so it it stands. It does not say. Uh, what the fine would be, but it gives you a year or, it, um, but it does set a, a fine. Um, and then you have the Antiquities Act. It has section 22 talks about execution of development schemes, new constructions and promise pro proximity to immovable antiquity. Um, and here, you know, you have a, a, a kind of buffer zone that they introduce of, of 200 feet um, and that no development or plan can be done within that unless an approval is appro um, uh, um, uh, given by the director. So, so that's interesting. Um, and then let's, let's talk about uh, the Sindh Cultural Heritage Preservation Act uh, of 1994. So as you know, that after the devolution, uh, this is now uh, really what is um, managing the heritage in, in the province. Um, so, under this, interestingly, this has a different definition. It has a very short definition. So it talks about value, right? But it's archeological, architectural, historical, cultural, or national value. Um, we are not sure what these values should mean, um, but, but interestingly, what's very interesting about that is that it includes just the land externally appurtenant, such there too, and the outer walls thereof. So it doesn't really protect anything that's on the inside. It's really just protecting facades. Um, 
And then again, here you have the advisory committee. Uh, in this, the advisory committee is, is further described. Um, you know, you talk about, so in, in, the, in the Antiquities Act, it was very vague. It could be anyone who understands antiquity, but here it says architectural historians, archeologists, heritage conservators, scholars of traditional arts and crafts. Um, what's very interesting about this one is that the members hold office on the pleasure of the government. So there's no tenure. So you can just, the committee can be the same committee for indefinite periods of time. Um, and then section eight talks about um, agreements. So the agreements kind of, when I was talking about the ancient monuments act, you know, you, you saw how you could get into agreements with the uh, with um, owners, private owners of private property. Um, that kind of extended out into the Antiquities Act. And then it also kind of extends out into the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act. Um, and then it has a penalty again. Um, and here the penalty is extended. So it's def defined to a lakh rupees and the imprisonment is extended to three years. So earlier in the Antiquities Act, it was one year, but now it's up to three years or both. Um, interestingly, section 21 is that no suit or prosecution or other legal proceedings shall lie against the government, the committee, the chairman, member, or any other officer of the committee in respect to anything done or intended to be done in good faith under this act or rules made, made there, there under. So basically it just indemnifies the, commu the committee that's making these decisions or the government that is making these decisions. So it's basically giving them legal protection. So anything that you dislike you, uh, or the commu committee says no or yes to, and if you disagree with them, you can't really have any kind of discussion after that because their decision is kind of final. Um, and then, so let's talk about the Karachi Building and Town Planning Act, uh, Town Planning Regulation of 2000. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the text that was as amended of 2002. So chapter 15 is um, preservation of heritage buildings. Interestingly, the, the, at the right off the bat, it says these definitions shall be confined to this chapter only. So we don't want to extend it out into any of our other leaking into any of our other um, parts of our of our act of our regulation. Um, and then they don't really define heritage buildings. They just say anything that's protected under the Cultural Preservation Act. And then part two is extension or extend meanings the making of an addition to a heritage. Building. So so here, unlike in the synth culture, so it's interesting because the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act doesn't have any provisions for making additions to heritage buildings. Um, and, you know, so, and then here it talks about, you need to get an approval from the government of, so you need to get an approval from the department or the committee prior, but interestingly, there is no provision in the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act for any approvals to be given for development or, um, you know, in or around heritage buildings, because the, the act, the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act actually um, doesn't allow for any, it just restricts development. It doesn't really um, talk about it. And, and really it only protects the ex external uh, facade of the building anyway. So um, so it's it's a bit interesting that there, there's this kind of um, conflict here. Very interestingly, there is a transferable development rights clause. I don't know if this has been used um, or put into, um, you know, actual uh, test in the in the market. But what it does is that it basically you have um, an FSR. So say, for example, I own a building um, at, in, in, say, for example, Souther and you own a building uh, next door to mine um, and you want to develop your, your lot um, and you can then buy. So say, for example, we can build 50 stories and my building is 30, uh, two stories. I can sell you 48 uh, floors, the ratio of 48 floors, and you can then um, you know, build additional floors above your new development because I have sold you the unutilized floor area ratio from mine. Um, so there, there's some conditions on that. So for example, you know, you can only, you can sell it to 
uh, multiple people or one owner, but you can't sell more than one third. There's other conditions as well. Um, so this basically is an incentive clause, um, but uh, how, how, if it's been tested, I, I have no idea. Um, and then you need an approval for demolition, alteration or extension. And so they've got some laws that you need to get uh, an approval from the concerned department, which is the advisory committee. Um, and then interestingly, you only have 30 days in which to ex express any objection to such an alteration. So the department, even though you need an approval, you can still, you only have 30 days to provide that, um, which is interesting because sometimes these, these things can be very complex and you require additional, additional time. Um, so this is a really interesting um, quote that I read in, in one of the papers by Adnan Morshed. And it is often the cry for preserving a historical building remains cloistered within an elitist and at times dogmatic advoc advocacy powered by disciplinary jargon that is hardly understood by the public. It does not help that preservation specialists premise their campaigns on a sentimental lament for lost glory or on a museum-like approach to preservation itself. In doing so, they remove, or consciously or not, buildings from their broader economic and political context, as well as lived experiences. A change, of course, is required by which architects, planner, uh, and preservationists strive to build a stronger coalition with a larger segment of the public. Such an alliance might do well to promote a consensus around memory and architecture storytelling capabilities when necessary implications any uh, which necessarily implicates any given building or group of buildings in broader social, economic, and cultural discourses. Um, so we'll just go on to the gaps. So, so I'm going to talk about. So these are I've just put these in. There's no real um, priority or importance. Like they're they're just listed um, as they are. Um, so, so 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 in my opinion, the first gap is. Uh, the constitution, role, and function of the advisory committee. So um, the laws generally, they're talking about an advisory committee, but they don't really talk about what the role of that advisory committee and how it is formed, how long it's going to stay in power, what is the function of it? Do they, do they um, you know, have, because uh, a lot of it, you know, they're not allowed to, uh, you know, uh, they can serve in, at the pleasure of the government, um, uh, which is which is probably not, uh, you know, it indemnify, there's indemnification for them, so they don't have to face any legal proceedings, um, you know, what, what, what powers do they have, and also what's very interesting is that there's no clause in this for administrative support, so for example, an advisory committee made of seven people, and say you have about you know, 2,400 2, listed buildings in, in Karachi, how, how are seven people supposed to manage or uh, you know, have oversight for that many buildings and keep, a, keep an eye out? So you know, really having an administrative function. Also, you know, does the advisory committee, yes, there you know, there's seven people who, have who understand things, but you, know, do you, you don't have any structural, uh, engineers or any, you know, because, you know, th there's, there's so many other technical, uh, you know, um, uh, expertise required when dealing with heritage buildings. How do you, do you, do you have a, a, a specially formulated technical advisory panel or, or, you know, because really the, the advisory committee should also be listing new uh, new um, buildings. And that, and that leads me to my second one. So, are, is the advisory committee maintaining a register or historical data? What has happened at these listed buildings over time? Uh, you know, uh, do you have, um, when was the last time some works happened at some places? There's, and then also these registers and, and these, this data we'll come to a, at a, later, a, a little further, but just when you're talking about the register, so so right now we just have these lists, right? So it's just the name of of a of a building, um, and and really there's no criteria for listing. So what is so we have a very material. So as in the Ancient Monuments Preservation Act, you know, and and I talked about it earlier when you had you know the that kind of 
division of Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist um, buildings, it, it, it did, and that material, you know, uh, manifestation of, of or understanding of, of heritage versus what, what is now really called a values-based approach. Um, so why is it significant? So, you know, you kind of look at how, you know, so in under the, the, the act that I operate in, in New South Wales, um, there is, there's five list, six, six criteria for listing. So one is, um, historical, uh, which which the most of our acts also have, but then there's also associative. So who is who or what is it associated with? So if there's people or communities or, you know, specific um, uh, positions in the past groups or, you know, things like that. Um, and then you have um, social. So what is the social value of this of this building, um, and then you have aesthetic and technical. Um, how is the aesthetic or the technical value that is ascribed to this building adds to its significance? Um, and then you have uh, rarity, which is how is this building rare? Like, is it, it are there 10,000 of them uh, or is there just like one or two of them? Um, and then there's representative. So is it um, a, a representative of a, a type or a type uh, or, a, or, a, or a particular kind of, of, of heritage. Um, and then, so when you have that kind of values-based uh, main uh, listing where, where you kind of really try to understand why the building is, needs to be listed, you then can manage the significance as well. So you're then, you know, so when there's work happening in or around that building, you're kind of saying, okay, so if this works were to happen to this X building, how would it impact its significance and how would it impact its value? So you're basically measuring the value that is associated to the building rather than just focusing on, you know, the civilization or the age of that building. Um, and then gap three is really about, you know, the integration of heritage and planning instruments. As you saw, there is, you know, the Karachi uh, building and town planning regulation makes provisions that don't exist in the Sindh Cultural Heritage Preservation Act. So, so how can one act make the, so the advisory committee run is, uh, you know, is, is working under the, the Sindh Cultural Heritage Preservation Act, and it can only do things that are le legally, um, that it is legally allowed to do under that act. Whereas the Karachi Building and Town Planning Act allows, gives it further, um, you know, it, 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 it gives it further responsibilities, which, which it cannot actually uh, carry out because the act under which it operates doesn't have those provisions. So, so there, there is that kind of disconnect between the heritage and planning instruments. I'm, I'm not going to go into, I'm not an urban planner, so I'm not really going to go into details of what is lacking in the planning instruments, but but just as, as a kind of, the, the planning instruments are also lacking severely because they, you know, most of them just say, or this in uh, the SPCA ordinance or the under, um, or this in this, this uh, Karachi building town planning regulation, they basically just say, okay, well, if you want to do a development, you make a drawing and you make a material specification and you have it, um, you know, uh, approved. Um, but, but in fact, you know, what really needs to happen from an urban planning scheme of a, a point of view is that there should be an impact like a review of the environmental factors what will this development do to the urban context of 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 the city um what are the environments so what would it do to to traffic to noise to water to sewage um you know to heritage um you know it, the impacts of any development should really be measured according to not just you know oh yes this building is going to go up in this area but how does it impact all the other environmental factors um that 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 that, that constitute an urban center or even a regional center for, for that matter. So, you know, you, you need to have regional plans because, you know, as development is, uh, you know, as the, as, uh, you know, urbanization rapidly is happening, you have massive regional areas that are 
quickly becoming urban centers. And so you need to have regional planning, planning instruments as well that, that speak to you know, other parts of, of the environment as well. So really talking about you know, how heritage is not just, is just one arm of many environmental factors that need to be included in the planning instruments and they need to be dealt with effectively. Um, and then gap four is means for development. So I think this is this is a bit controversial um, because a lot of the times, you know, the, the, we are heritage, you know, uh, practitioners are seen as anti-development. But but really, I think being a bit pro-development is good because it allows, you know, un, like scripted development to happen. So you know you how how can because the, currently the legislation does not have any framework for how applications are made what is the regulatory approval process how is decision making done uh, you know uh, what what are the what is the criteria under which decision making is made um, which which decisions are made how do you how how do you you know where, where, which i was talking about earlier how do you for, for each development, how do you kind of integrate it into an assessment of the impact it makes to not just heritage, but to all the environmental factors that, that constitute our, our urban. Uh, and, and I think that kind of inclusion of, of those kind of clauses within the Heritage Act on how development within heritage buildings can be made is, is very important and, and kind of missing still. Um, and then I'm going to talk about transparency of this decision making. So, so how is a decision made? So why why something said yes to and why something said no to? Is it is it a matter of managing? It really talks to that earlier um, gap that I was talking about on on how ma significance is managed and how uh, you know how, is 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 the significance managed well enough so that a decision is you know either way so it could be a a, a refusal or an approval um, but but there there needs to be a transparency in that decision making so it can't just be willy-nilly you know anyone decide a, a member of or you know the advice no offense to the advisory committee but you know for them to just decide yeah well this looks good or this doesn't look good do they have you know um there is something called a have your say provision so a lot in a lot of cases um the heritage legislation has something which is called a have your say provision. Well, it's not necessarily termed as that, but but what it does is that it advertises to the general public. So say, for example, I want to, I own a heritage building and I want to make an extension in it. Um, and uh, what, what the le legislation should actually do is that it, it notifies my neighbors and says, well, this is what I'm going to do, or, you know, it notifies, there's um, advertising in, uh, in the, in the new newspaper or, you know, whichever, whatever have you, but there's an advertising period where members of the public can come in and say, well, no, you, this shouldn't be done because of X, Y, Z. Uh, reasons and and those should be the, those should form part of the decision making so so you know so you get the community involved you it's not like you know once the building has been changed completely beyond its beyond recognition then it's like you know then there's like uproars because that's like a knee-jerk reaction so but if you're informing the community that lives around or is or you know civil society that is involved in heritage of things that are going to happen before they happen and also include their uh, opinion um, in your decision making it it makes a, a much more cohesive kind of community that that feels Feels like they're part of part of the decision making of their city, um, and then gap six is development incentive clauses. So of course we talked about one of the in, in incentive clauses in in the Karachi uh, town planning and uh, building and town planning regulation, and and there are there that incentive clause is there, but but how many people know about it um you know there could be other incentive clauses like tax rebates or um you know or, or, or uh you know uh there's the, there's open houses and you you can you can 
um, you know, open your, your heritage building to, to the general public for a day and charge money. There should be, you know, there, there's, so for example, uh, one of the clauses that I've, I've read, uh, you know, uh, been working with is, is, um, is change of land use. So what you can do is that you can change the land use of, uh, of your site if you protect the heritage building that is within it. So, you know, so for example, you could have, a, a, if, if you have a residential property uh, that is in R1 zone, so you can only have two, le two, two levels, two story building, um, but you have this massive uh, lot around it and there's, a, a lot, there's enough land to build an apartment building, for example. If you say that I will conserve and, um, you know, bring this uh, heritage uh, cottage or house into, you know, I'll conserve it to the maximum, I can then put an apartment building at the back. So, so it, you're able to change the land so you can move your lot from R2, uh, R1 to R2 zone, for example, or, you know, things like that. So, so unprohibited la land use change, um, uh, which so, and there's many other, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, heritage legislation across the world, there's many, many different incentive clauses that are, that are included. Um, and, they, and they give, you know, they give an incentive to the owner to protect their and look after their heritage building. Um, and then gap seven is legal proceedings. So, you know, I, I pointed that out in the Synth Cultural Heritage Preservation Act, that it indemnifies the community, the, the heritage uh, advisory committee or the government from their decision. So any, so say, for example, you say that, you know, if I'm, I'm making, I'm trying, uh, proposing to do it. A development on my property and and the advisory committee says no i have no way to appeal that i have no way to say you know uh that their your decision is incorrect um uh it 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 not only it not only limits my rights as as an owner of the property it also uh, you know gives uh, an insurmountable power to the advisory committee and and of course you know, if there is the fear of legal proceedings, decisions are made with more transparency. They are made with more weight. And um, you know, I, as a, I, I am a, an, a, an assessment officer, and, and this is what I do. I, I uh, assess uh, uh, development applications, and and you know, all the decisions that we make are, uh, uh, you know, at the back of your mind, you have this constant thing. Would this stand in land and environment court? Will this is 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 this decision, uh, you know, following all the all the all the uh, you know values that, that is it managing the significance? Is it you know is it um, you know is it reasonable? Because reasonable you know causes are or also challenged in land and environment court. So you're constantly thinking about how your decision is is uh, fair. Um, and then, and then gap eight uh, is Mariam, really just uh, <clears throat> a heads yeah. up on time. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, this is my last slide. Um, and then I'm just talking about compliance versus penalty. Um, so really I feel this is very interesting because all the acts talk about penalty, but do they ever really get, uh, implemented is one lakh rupees enough or not? That's so, you know, really it's. I feel that it would be better to talk about compliance rather than penalty. So how can you get people to comply to existing provisions rather than say that, you know, you're going to be, uh, you know, fined or sent to prison? Because, you know, you always catch more uh, people through honey rather than, than a stick. Um, and then I'm just going to end with um, this uh, quote from Donovan Rep. Uh, Rep Keme, uh, only the foolish city will make the choice between historic preservation and economic development. The vice city will utilize its historic built environment to meet the economic, social, and cultural needs of its citizens far into the future. Um, and we really need to decide what kind of city we want to be. Um, yeah. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much. Okay. This was an excellent session, uh, Mariam. And thanks for taking us through the timeline, especially with, you know, colonial legal framework to SIND Act 1994. I think it really puts in perspective 
And also bringing those uh, categories where you talked about how it's done internationally, where history, association, aesthetics, rarity, all these are very important in making a decision. I'm very, very inclined towards opening up the queries here to the public, and I do see your hands here uh, with Sara Shamim. But before we go there, um, my question, and I'm really glad to have Arif, and um, I see some, you know, Zubair Saab is also here, who's, who's, who does amazing environmental and legal um, work in, in the practical grounds. And also Tanya is around, so she's doing her research right now. So some really eminent people are here who are listening and, and are part of the heritage conversation. Uh, my, my starting question with you is that you talked about uh, <clears throat> Karachi building town planning regulations as, as like a, a stitch between the heritage laws and then going towards uh, Karachi building town planning regulations. What, when you, when you, whatever you've experienced and whatever you've looked into from a lens of being on ground as well as separating it yourself, you know, being uh, seeing it from far, what do you think right now is, is, is the major problem? Let's let's start with that really large umbrella kind of an issue, and then we'll go into minor queries. Yeah, look, I think I think one of the most important things that I, I kind of talked about uh, as well was was that you know currently in terms of the the, the urban urban uh, regulation, it really it's really lacking. It really just kind of when you look at at what is required to make to make a development application or to construct something in Karachi, they really just want you to submit a drawing and want you to submit, um, you know, a material specification. Um, you know, there's, there's, I think, a, a, a requirement for a seismic um, a report um, and uh, and a ground disturbance report, but really nothing else. So really, you're not required to assess the environmental, uh, you know, review the the environmental factors that your development is going to impact, and that includes heritage, right? So so obviously, you know, if if I'm if I'm building it, it it also doesn't talk about state significant in infrastructure or development. So so you know roads or uh, railways or trams or you know so so really I think there is that kind of really big lack in how the city is. So there is a master plan. I understand that 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 master plan is also now a strategic master plan. It's not necessarily a a set master plan. It doesn't you know uh, it's not set in stone. It doesn't really you know it just gives you a strategic kind of guideline of where the city is headed um but what 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 really i think is is problematic is that the, the there is no way to measure how development is impacting the city and there is no onus so, so the onus is not the onus is not on the developer to to provide that information either how 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 is this Hundred of sixty-story building going to impact the water, uh, uh, you know, water or sewage. How is it going to impact noise and traffic, and and really, and if there if it's in Sudder, how is it impacting the many heritage buildings that are surrounding it, um, and and obviously, you know, heritage is just one aspect of a larger larger uh, conundrum of uh, you know a Pandora's box of of uh, factors that that imp that are impacted by development. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so it's, I think... it's, a, it's a whole rupture of like, I totally agree with that, that uh, it's also a, a violence towards scalability. You're, you're, you're kind of like uh, uh, rupturing the neighborhood zone, the scale of it, like bringing, yeah. bring an architecture which is so alien to the zone. We'll take a question from Sara Shamim. Would you like to, um, you know, either open your video or just ask us a question? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really, really helpful. Um, and it educated me a lot about heritage preservation. My question uh, pertains more particularly to the Karachi Building and Town Planning Regulations Act. Um, you talked about transferable development rights and how this is like incentive development. And then you also talk about uh, this, you talk about incentives and in the gaps, if I'm not wrong. Uh, is there a conversation to be had about the transferable development rights and floor to area ratios in terms of like sustainable urban development and like are there sustainability implications of floor to area ratios and the fact that 
this ratio can be sold or transferred to neighboring lots so i look for mariam starts i just want to give a little heads up here that our next session where arif bilgomi uh, manzoor kanastro and uh, a doctor from ned uh, mansoora will be talking uh, arif will be talking a lot in detail about transferable rights uh, but of course mm-hmm. i let mariam also share her experience on this but uh, do tune in to the other session with us it's going to talk about a lot more in detail mariam all right okay Thank look uh, look i think uh, you know when you're talking about heritage her- heritage in itself is a sustainable good it's it's uh, you know you're you're making sure you're when you're keeping an old building you're you're uh, not uh, you know increasing the carbon oh. footprint of of the city um, heritage buildings are notoriously better climate controlled um so 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 heritage building is sustainable in 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 just being there in just being there um and then if you're if you if you manage to have if you're in a very dense a rapidly densified area like for example old town um where you know the the air, the floor the area to the floor to height uh ceiling ratio is is kind of increased fsr is increased um by by being by by allowing someone to buy the fsr from you you're automatically um you know saving the heritage building a you have you have gains in that and then obviously uh, there are implications for how the new building is being done but then it brings me back to to my earlier discussion about how is impact being measured if if a if a developer is saying that he's going to build a, a building for for 30 30 uh, stories and then is buying 20 stories more and is now going to build a 50 story building he has to then provide um, you know a, an impact assessment to how that 50 story building is going to operate within the within the urban environment is is there even an infrastructure to provide for electricity for for water for um, you know for plumbing services for noise for traffic how how is that going to happen so obviously it's all interconnected um and and there are implications but but the interconnected nature of the in- urban environment is is what makes um you know uh, it can't be isolated from one another is, is i guess what i'm trying to say all right thank you so much that actually does help answer my question so thank you but do no, tune no. into our next session you'll 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 get more clarity with uh, arif saab's uh, presentation muzaffar would you like to continue with the queries uh assalam alaikum yeah i had a question can you hear me yeah we can hear you uh, i had a question that you were pointing out the gaps in the ways that heritage law etc uh, preserve uh, i had a question that do you see any reason or structural reasoning why these gaps exist in the way heritage is preserved um look i think i think what's so look i think one of the biggest issues is that we have a colonial hangover we haven't we haven't uh, the reason so when if you read about early colonial heritage legislation uh it it is a means to own buildings all right it is there is there is there is also this kind of um narrative about you know that india is in its decline or pakistan in the subcontinent is in its decline and and that we are the saviors and we are going to save the the buildings from from decay and destruction and and how are we going to save it we're going to you know preserve them in this massive you know majestic way where they uh you know they're set in opulent old uh you know opulent gardens and you know pristine areas and then and then that kind of never we never kind of got over that we never really talked about how 
heritage in South Asia is, is so much more than just a beautiful building in a garden. It's, it's about its context. It's about how people interact with it, how intangible aspects of, of it, you know, there's how it's, it because most of it is living. So most of our heritage are of our, you know, so for example, Makli is, is, is a graveyard where active burials want people want to have active burials but because it's a it's a monument it, they're monuments to a certain glorified past you can't do that so you're 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 dispossessing local communities um and and you haven't really and and you have the ability to to make that reform right because you now own these things so reform is very important our reforms the two acts that we've passed they've actually just been you know a, a rehashing of the original ancient monuments preservation act there is no discussion around um you know a uh, 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 values based approach there's no discussion around intangible aspects of of heritage there's no talking about the landscapes that surround the uh, the buildings it's 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 very limited in its scope and reforms are what we are is needed that's that's the 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 solution we need regulatory reform yeah i mean it's it's very important to bring an example here as you said about landscape <clears throat> sometimes the ice you isolate the built environment from the open uh, uh, spaces completely and, and kind of have a disconnect conversation. That's what happened with Frere Hall. Um, the advocacy began from, from keeping that unobstructed view. And in the court, they kept on saying that the gardens are not part of heritage. I mean, how can a department state such a huge uh, uh, claim by, by thinking that landscapes are not part of the, uh, the listed environment? But that's uh, the thing, Namarvi, because you don't have a managed register, right? So your register is just a name, right? It doesn't talk yeah. about why this building is listed. It doesn't talk about, you know, yes, the Frere Hall is listed for its architectural interest, but why? Like, wh what is the architectural interest? What about it? What What is the extent of it? What is, you know, how, how are the gardens playing a role? How is the, uh, the views? Are there significant view lines? Are there, you know, the and then obviously we we don't that's the first step you then have conservation management plans for all all items that are listed but but obviously we don't even have a register to start with so what are we going to talk i mean, I mean another it's a very example important, yeah Another Sorry, example is another example is is the Empress Market. So what happened there? You know, you of course there was encroachments, and there is a, day, a way to deal with encroachments. But but there is a way, right? Like you know, you what? How does how do those encroachments add value to the to the to the the heritage uh, the economy yeah. economy? Yeah, and it how does it add value to the building itself, right? Because the building is not in isolation; it it exists in a context and so you can't just have that view that oh it needs to be you know you can't have a view of like you know queen victoria building in in sydney or for example or anywhere in you know in in the in the western world and then try to implement implement that in in pakistan because there's a different um you know uh, yeah and uh, rf is right that 200 feet arbit is arbitrary so so different buildings have different uh you know uh, uh Bound. So, so there is something called a curtilage, right? So, as a, a, a heritage curtilage. So, an heritage curtilage could be, you know, it could be like two feet from from around the building, or it could be two hundred feet, or even two thousand feet. Because where where are significant view lines made to it? So, for example, if uh, if there is significant, if there's something is on on top of a hill, right? Like, say, for example, there's a building on top of a hill, and you can see it from, say. 30 kilometers away is that it's curtilage that 30 kilometer radius is that the curtilage so you know there's there's a there is important things that need to be defined when something is listed and i think that's that's a that's a missing that's a really big missing um, aspect because we don't know why these things are listed they're just listed on a register and are do they even need 
to be listed? Do we need to have like 1,600 buildings in, in Old Town listed? Or do they all have equal merit? Is there, is there, are there reasons why these buildings are listed? And, and that, that listing needs to be referred, re, uh, you know, visited from time to time. Because, you know, so, so for example, so many of these buildings that are listed have nothing there left anymore. It's just, you know, a shell of a wall, all the, you know, uh, uh, jarokas and all the balustrades and all the, uh, ex you know, beautiful um, carvings have been stripped oh, off. The aesthetics are gone. Yeah. yeah. So why, why is that building yeah, listed? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, these are like really important queries and especially um, uh, right now, like uh, Arif talks about, I mean, Arif mentions here uh, that Mariam's presentation raises some very important pertinent issues which he will try to expand uh, in his presentation. Uh, another thing that, you know, I mean, politics of view, as you mentioned, is, is something like I'm really, really interested. Recently, Mars, uh, I had requested Mars to develop, uh, I mean, he's also part of the, uh, right now in audience, to develop an illustration that how do you view, I mean, the, the politics of view is so incredibly uh, um, uh, important right now, especially in a dense city like Karachi. Every like your um, your view could be my uh, viewpoint of environmental openness, you know. So Mary Kirki, yeah, my backside of my house is critically important right now for the view. But if a high rise comes in, what kind of uh, environmental obstructions does it bring in? Wind ho gaya, view ho gaya, sun ho gaya. These are not part of the registry at the moment. All we are doing right now is whatever we map initially and is a very flat out re, uh, uh, mapping of the city. We haven't many families have been transferred into this or how has it been occupied? So this kind of individual research and then, I mean, of course, I know that NED runs this incredible heritage cell, but it is also restricted towards mapping. What we really need is to grow on that research, you know, so, so would you like to expand yeah, on look, that think, and give us examples? I think, look, Marvi, that, that's what I was kind of alluding to when I was talking about the constitution and the role and function of the advisory committee, because really this is not the job of, you know, a private organization. It is really the advisory committee should have a regulatory, because the advisory committee has a regulatory function. Obviously it's understandable. There's only seven of them or six of them and they can't do it. So they need administrative support because, you know, active listing, there needs to be updating of the listing. There needs to be, and, and obviously you or I sitting in our offices doing this research, it's not really going to do anything because that research is just going to be there, right? But there needs to be, there needs to be certain, um, you know, a, 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 an organization, a governmental organization that is actually actively participating in this, right? So the, obviously I know the department exists, but the department doesn't really have a role under the legislation. It's the advisory committee. The advisory committee is running everything, right? And so the advisory committee needs to have Okay, so let's say the advisory committee gets administrative support from the department of uh, from the department, right? So what is the department doing? Is the department actively pursuing new listings? No, they're not. Are they actively updating existing listings? No, they are not. Are they actually maintaining existing records? Do they know what has happened at what listing at what time? They don't, right? So what is the administrative support of the department? What is the function of the of the administrative support? Because this is what the administrative support should be. It should allow the Heritage Committee to actively pursue new nominations, to actively update existing listings, and, and also keep a record and and all this while also giving approvals for new developments within the listings that exist right so obviously there there is there is that which which is which is greatly missing and and i feel that and i also uh, you feel like advisory committee sorry can go ahead nahi nahi pata pata aage pata nahi main ye i think advisory committee should also be like a decentral body right so every City, major city in Sindh, for example, if it is a Sindh Act that we are talking about, 
why should it be just in Karachi? This such advisory board should be in every other major city so that they can counter. Why must a, a code DG key building ka issue come to Karachi to this advisory, which is so alienated and disconnected from the context of their area? So it needs well, to have like yeah. I think a larger framework. Well, I, I kind of disagree about that because I feel that that you know the the advisory committee really the the members that constitute the advisory committee should have more far-reaching uh, understanding of the state because you're looking really looking at the state and it kind of gives uh, a, a a more um, consistency in, in in approvals right so so you you should you should be you should the decisions of the advisory committee should really be consistent um and 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 having that one advisory committee is important but having administrative support from the department that understands and so like so for example the way that that uh that it works in in new south wales is that the advisory the it's, it's called the heritage council so the heritage council is one uh, you know, independent body. It is appointed by the minister, but they act independently. Uh, we have, they, they have uh, some commit subcommittees. So they have a technical advisory committee. They have uh, an approvals committee. They have a state heritage register committee. And so each committee has different functions that they, that they uh, do. So, so for example, for the approvals committee, they just approve development applications. And then they have a support from the Heritage New South Wales, for which I work, right? So what I'm doing is that any development application, be it for somewhere in the regions or in the city, metropo metropolitan areas, those applications come to us. And obviously you then under try to understand the context in which it is, it is placed and you make decision based on an assessment of the impacts that, that that development would do. And those impacts actually measure how they impact the assessment or the significance of the building. So there is a, a a, a, a logical way to what how decisions are being made right and then obviously the context is very important because you're considering view lines you're considering the local context you're considering how environmental factors are are being affected and this is just heritage right the urban approval is being given by a different by a local council or by the department of planning or whoever and they or, or local government and they have their own set of factors that they're considering which includes noise and traffic and pollution and water and electricity and all the other things, fire, safety, you know, all of those other things. And obviously, the, the fact of the matter is that the town, Karachi town planning and building regulation just regulates Karachi. It doesn't regulate regional. What are the regional plans? I'm, I don't profess to know much about it, but I don't think that there's any regional uh, development plan that exists that manages how development is going to happen in the regions. Um, what and 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 you know and I'm talking about you know it 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 impacts even how uh, you know disaster is impacted because you know development is happening a disaster happens there's massive redevelopment rehabilitation works happening across the country, but there's no plan that measures where these development uh, projects can happen and you know you've got buildings after buildings happening on water sides without mapping of flooding. What happens if a 10 year flood comes? What happens in a hundred year flood comes? If, you know, uh, if, if uh, you know, 10 uh, thousand year flood, flood comes, there's no mapping of that. And, and development is just happening. Regional plans, development plans, control plans, and these don't exist. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, Abro Saab has a question here. Uh, Abro Saab, you're absolutely correct. They've been uh, censored, these acts. I mean, in the recent uh, chapter, they were kind of removed. There was only heading. But of course, Mariam can expand on it, and I'll read out the query here. Um, Abro Saab says, Mariam, correct me, I believe Chapter 15 of KBTP regulation dealing with transferable rights has been declared ultra wires to the SPCO by the, by the Sindh High Court and there is no more transferable rights available. Well, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not really aware of uh, th this, but um, it, it, you could be correct. Um, and, and even if, even if it wasn't declared, uh, you know, if, 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 even if it wasn't declared, I don't think that it has been used um, in, in the past. I just, I just kind of, brought that up because it exists like that's the thing that in the regulation it, it, it exists and the sin i mean obviously we'd have to read the sin high court's verdict um it's 
uh it's 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 interesting because you can't just it a bill cannot just uh be you know uh, re uh, repealed uh, in in high court the court can have a case law um that says that this is not allowed in this instance but it cannot re, you know change legislation so um i i don't i don't uh, understand how uh this has happened because he might have said no in a certain con, con, uh case but the 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 act itself cannot be cannot be repealed yeah, unless it really passes through parliament interesting notes that arif saab and and zubair saab are putting in the chat box so if there are any students and others who are interested please click on them i think they're very important uh we we will expand on this conversation when arif is presenting because i think that topic is totally for that session so we are going to sign off now as well uh as arif arif sab also needs to leave but thank you so much mariam this has been an amazing session